Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to a new video. In this video, I'm going to be tackling in detail David's fifth strongest argument against Islam. Sadly, unfortunately, Yasser Qadhi actually supports the report that David's going to bring, so naturally he's going to be refuted as well. Let's get to it. Muhammad had an adopted son named Zayd, who was called Zayd bin Muhammad, Zayd, son of Muhammad. One day, Muhammad went to visit him and was greeted by Zayd's wife, Zainab, who was one of the most beautiful women in Arabia and who was wearing very little clothing at the time. Here's what happened, according to the Muslim historian Tabari. She jumped up in haste and excited the admiration of the messenger of God so that he turned away, murmuring something that could scarcely be understood. However, he did say overtly, Glory be to God the Almighty. Glory be to God who causes hearts to turn. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to respond to is that what he's quoting here is not reliable. If we go back to the previous page, as we can see here, he's actually quoting a report that's being narrated by Abdullah bin Amr al-Aslami, who is a weak narrator. Now, referring to him as a weak narrator is quite an understatement. If you actually go back to his uh, biography and books like Tadib al-Tarib, Mizan al-Atidal, you'll find that he's not just like a weak narrator, but he's a very, very weak narrator. He's been criticized by many scholars of hadith. The second issue with the chain is that it's also narrated by Muhammad bin Yahya bin Habban, who is a late tabi'i, meaning this report is disconnected. He did not witness the event. He's a late narrator in that sense. However, in my opinion, the biggest issue with the hadith is that it's reported by Muhammad bin Umar al-Waqidi. Muhammad bin Umar al-Waqidi is actually a fabricator of hadiths. He's been uh, condemned as a liar by many major hadith scholars, including Ali bin Madini, Ishaq bin Rahawi, uh, al-Nasai, and Abu Hatim al-Razi. So in short, the hadith includes a very weak narrator, is disconnected, and also includes a liar. Zainab had found out that Muhammad was attracted to her, and seeing the opportunity to move up in the world, she began despising her husband. Okay, so this isn't even in the report, but it's just an embellishment that David Wood is putting in here to spice things up. Zayed, wanting to give his adopted father and prophet whatever he desired, divorced his wife, and Muhammad married her. Not surprisingly, people started complaining. What sort of man marries a woman who's been having sex with his own adopted son? How did Muhammad respond to the criticism? He started receiving revelations to justify the marriage. Allah revealed Surah 33 verses 4 to 5, abolishing adoption in Islam. Uh, no, this is incorrect. Uh, Surah 33 verses 4 and 5 were revealed before this. Adoption was already abolished. Uh, David claiming that it was abolished due to this incident is incorrect. But in the Quran, we have Allah's explanation. Allah says to Muhammad, we gave her to you as a wife so that there should be no difficulty for the believers in respect of the wives of their adopted sons when they have accomplished their want of them. So Allah gave Zainab to Muhammad so that other Muslim men would know that it's okay to marry the divorced wives of their adopted sons. Three quick problems with Allah's explanation. One, how many men really struggle with whether or not they should be marrying the divorced wives of their own adopted sons? Apart from Muhammad, I've never heard of anyone who needed divine guidance on this issue. Actually, divine guidance seems to be quite necessary here. Um, and the reason is because, according to the Meccan pagans, it actually was taboo. Now, biblically, it isn't taboo. Um, and ironically, it seems like David's leaning towards the pagan position. And I believe that he's leaning towards the pagan position simply because it conflicts with Islam. I do feel it's quite important to provide some sort of historical context to this. You see, it was quite common for men in pre-Islamic Arabia to marry the widows of deceased fathers and sons. In Suddi reports in Tafsir al-Tabari that if a father or a son passed away, 
the other would toss a piece of cloth upon the spouse of the deceased, claiming her as his own wife without paying a new dowry. Now, this type of marriage was referred to as nikah al baizan and even though it was disliked by most Arabs, it was a common practice. However, when Islam came, Islam naturally abolished the practice. Remember that this is about fathers and their biological sons. Islam, on the other hand, doesn't recognize adopted sons as real sons. Second, assuming that Allah wants men to know that it's okay to marry the divorced wives of their own adopted sons, does he really need Muhammad to go out and do it? Wouldn't it be enough for Allah to say in the Quran, Hey guys, in case you're wondering, yes, it's perfectly acceptable in Islam to start lusting after your adopted son's wives until your adopted sons divorce them, and then you can marry them. Is this such an incredibly important issue that Allah not only had to reveal a Quran verse about it, but also needed Muhammad to break up a marriage and show us how it's done? Okay, so as I've established earlier in the video, the Prophet ﷺ did not lust after Zainab, and two, he didn't break up the marriage, and three, the hadith is a fabrication in the first place. Now, I'd like to direct you to some comments made by renowned Orientalist Montgomery Watt in regards to the matter. He says, It's not too much to say that Muhammad's marriages had a political aspect. There's a strong presumption that in the case of Zainab bint Jash, Muhammad was not carried away by passion, but was looking at the political implications of the match. Check out the footnote here, uh, footnote number three is quite an interesting point as well. If Muhammad had merely wanted to marry Zainab, he could have made this a khalisa, special privilege for himself. Since he made it a general rule, other points must be involved. Watt also says, despite the stories, then, it is unlikely that he was swept off his feet by the physical attractiveness of Zainab. The other wives are said to have feared her beauty, but her age, when she married Muhammad, was 35 or perhaps 38, which is fairly advanced for an Arab woman. Now, I'd like to point out how absurd the story really is. Um, you see, Zainab is a prophet's cousin, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which means that he had seen her before. All right. This was he had seen her before the verses of hijab were revealed. He had seen her before hijab was made mandatory. He actually hooked her up with Zayd bin Haritha. He is the reason they got married in the first place. So this idea that he saw her at Zayd's house and fell in love with her doesn't make any sense. Third, Allah abolished adoption in Surah 33, verses four to five. Muslims are still free to take care of orphans, but they don't adopt them into their families. So if there's no more adoption in Islam, why in the name of common sense is Allah telling Muhammad that he has to marry Zainab so that other Muslim men will know that it's okay to marry the divorced wives of their adopted sons? There aren't going to be any more adopted sons, so the situation isn't going to exist for Muslims. Why would Allah tell Muhammad to do something in order to set an example for other Muslims facing the same problem when there aren't going to be any other Muslims facing the same problem? That's actually a good question, David, and I can think of two reasons off the top of my head. The first reason is society was hesitating because th this was a taboo, right? Um, so when Rasulullah actually married Zainab, that ended that taboo. Secondly, there are millions of non-Muslims with adopted sons in the world. I think like 5 million in the United States alone. Now, if someone wanted to convert to Islam and he had an adopted son, then this would be guidance for him. And this applies to you as well, David. If you were to one day convert to Islam, you would need that spiritual guidance to better understand the uh, relationship between you and your emotionally challenged adopted son. Ridvan. But instead of admitting that he had done something wrong, he justified what he had done and abolished one of humanity's most humane practices in the process. Yeah, not really. Um, you see, sponsoring orphans, taking care of them, raising them, loving them is not prohibited in Islam. What's prohibited in Islam is giving them your name and the rights between a father and son. Uh, we do find a report in which Rasulullah says that I and the one who sponsors an orphan will be in paradise like 
these two. All right, now let's finally move on to Sheikh Dr. Yasser Qadi. Ibn Sa'ad says, and he has an isnad, by the way, so it's not as if he's narrating. It goes back to the Tabi'un. The Prophet went to visit Zayd, but Zayd was not home. And Zainab came to answer his knock, and this was before hijab had been revealed. This is a key point here. Hijab has not come down yet. The verse to cover your hair has not come down. So she comes rushing and the Prophet ﷺ saw her and then averted his gaze. So the very fact that he's turning away indicates something. And she, he started saying things and Zainab just caught phrases. Subhanallah al-Azim, Subhana Musarrif al-Qulub. Okay, Subhanallah al-Azim, Subhana, the one who changes the hearts. Subhana Musarrif al-Qulub. And he walked away. He didn't say anything else. He simply turned around and walked away. Honestly, I don't find anything problematic about this at all. Okay, so first I'd like to point out that um, the report that Yasser is using here, again, is the same report that David was using previously. Now, um, yes, it's, it's the same fabricated report. It's a different source, the same exact chain. Now, for David to mess this up is, you know, I mean... Uh, what do you expect, right? But what's sad about Yasser using this fabrication is that Yasser is a graduate of Kulliyat al-Hadith, the College of Hadith in Medina University. And, I mean, Yasser, if you benefited something out of your years in Kulliyat al-Hadith, I mean, this should be it. Um, that's the, the first thing you're supposed to learn, uh, not rely on fabrications by liars, right? <sighs> Today's lecture will demonstrate as well a reality that I have hinted at before and by now we are, alhamdulillah, those that have been with me from the beginning. So now you know my, my, my um, style and my, uh, my, the, the importance that I give to academic integrity. I don't sugarcoat, I don't paint a rosy well. picture. I need to tell you the facts because if you don't hear them from me and you hear them from somebody else, then it's going to cause problems. Okay, so actually, I personally prefer for people to hear it from someone else for two reasons. Firstly, because what he claims are facts are not facts. Um, and secondly, and perhaps more importantly, um, they are relying on you, and they're not necessarily relying on folks like David Wood and Orientalists. I mean, if a young Muslim is listening to David Wood, they're thinking, hmm, I'm not even sure if I'm, I don't know if I'm supposed to trust this guy. This guy seems to be hateful. But Yasser, when you put this stuff out there, they eat up what you say without double checking it, without verifying it. And that's an issue. Ibn Ishaq, believe it or not, does not mention the entire incident, which is a big vacuum. Like the Quran is about this, but it's not there. And some have criticized him for not mentioning anything about the details of Zainab's story. Ibn Sa'ad, who is one of the earliest commentators of Sirah, uh, 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 his uh, biography, his tabaqat is well known, died 2.30. Ibn Sa'ad mentions the full details. And I'll call this basically the original prototype version or call it version A, if you like. And this is the detailed version that is found in pretty much every book of Sirah of early Islam and pretty much every book of uh, Hadith that mentions this story. And I'm going to call this version A. And it is the version that is found in the vast majority, dare I say, all of the earliest books of Sirah and Hadith and Tafsir, three genres. Sirah, Hadith, and Tafsir. And today I spent... Okay, so this is a major exaggeration because Yasser is claiming that these are in all books of Sirah, but Tayyip, he just mentioned just a little while ago, it's not in the most important book of Sirah, which is Sirat ibn Ishaq. Tayyip, what are the other early sources that are quoting this report, Ya Yasser? Maghazi al-Waqidi. MashaAllah, wow. Oh, great. The same person that you were quoting earlier, the guy who's fabricating the Hadiths. Ah... Now, you see, I, would, I, I wish that Yasser could provide some sort of a list of these books of Sirah that have included this report. Unfortunately, he uh, neglects to mention them in his lecture. Now, before carrying on, I'd like to share this little clip that was shared by Wasim Ismail um, on Facebook. So, let's check it out. It's quite a good refutation. Let me give you, for example, 
the earliest tafsirs written, tafsir of Abdul Razak in 211, tafsir of Ibn Abi Hatim in 327, uh, the tafsir of uh, Ibn Kathir, the earliest seerah books written, seerah of Ibn Ishaq, uh, the earliest hadith books written, the, the hadith of uh, the Sahih of, of Imam Bukhari, all of these books give a radically different story. And it's very clear to me that this was the normative understanding of early Islam. Uh, there are many early tafsirs of them as Muqatil ibn Sulaiman died 150 Hijrah. And he has this narrative as well. Another. Are you guys ready for another refutation? The question arises, where does this love story exist? Response, again we're getting a little bit academic here, but it exists in a tafsir called Tafsir Muqatil ibn Sulaiman. And Muqatil ibn Sulaiman by unanimous consensus is not a scholar, he's not a historian, he is a storyteller. He is a storyteller. In other words, he's a tabloid paper, he's not the New York Times. Literally, he's a tabloid paper. So the Orientalists, imagine, and I, I said this at an academic conference when I was defending the story uh, in, in a certain context. I said, imagine walking into uh, a bookstore, walking into a supermarket, and ignoring the New York Times, Ignoring, you know, the Washington Post, ignoring every single reputable, the Times Magazine, Newsweek, and getting your news from the Daily Inquirer, for example. This is the equivalent of what these people are doing. They ignore every single authentic, legitimate book, and they go to the most obscure references. How many of you have even heard of Tafsir Muqatil ibn Sulaiman? Yes, it exists. It's not a fabrication. Meaning the book is not a fabrication. What's inside it might be. But the book itself, it exists. How many of you are aware of it? Nobody. But these guys hunt down these stories, extract them, and popularize them. Now, here is my issue with Yasser's video. Not only is he relying on a fabrication, but perhaps one of the bigger issues is that he's accusing ulama of sanitizing the reports, right? Another thing that we learn, and I'll lay the beans very, just spill the beans very clearly. What we see here, and I find it problematic, very clearly I find it problematic. What we see is that some incidents, as Islamic history evolved, the story was sanitized and made easier and more palatable for the masses to deal with. So what do you mean by sanitization, Ya Yasser? Do you mean not including fabrications in late books? Is that what you refer to as sanitization? SubhanAllah, I mean, I think it's only normal to not include fabrications in works. And you are um, claiming that this is a bad thing? How is this a bad thing? Now this has become a general trend with Yasser. He would quote a false narrative, give it weight, highlight the works of Orientalists, exaggerate the problem, and then say, I am here to save the day, I'm going to be the guy who solves this issue and then provides some funky explanation or funky solution to the problem, which doesn't solve the problem at all. <laughs> and sadly, we've seen this time and time again. Now, before wrapping up this video, I'd like you guys to check out Wasim Ismail's video on the subject. It's very detailed. He goes point by point exposing how Yasir relies on fabricated hadiths and not only that but he exposes his misattributions to early scholars so barakallah fiq wasim jazakallah khairan and to the rest of you guys assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh